the eyes have it. It's the punchline to one of the more famous stories about Lincoln and his cabinet. When his cabinet was considering the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln looked to the members of his cabinet. Everyone was opposed. Lincoln's cabinet was the famous team of rivals celebrated in the book recently. William Seward at state, the office charged with ministry over foreign affairs. Salmon Chase at Treasury, whose name still lives on in the large New York bank. Blair at the Postmaster General, Gideon Wells at the Navy. Two positions which, incidentally, don't exist, but the 1860s were the hot stuff of federal government. The cabinet debated for a while, and then Lincoln asked for a vote. All were opposed. They desired to hold out longer before issuing such a proclamation even those who opposed slavery. But Lincoln thought the time was right to issue it. Seven no's and one eye, Lincoln said, and then in a little bit of play on words and a play on the power of the presidency, he said, the eyes have it. It's not clear if Lincoln really said that there is a lot of Lincoln myth out there, but it is indicative of how he dealt with the cabinet. And probably more than any antidote demonstrates the relationship between the presidency and that particular institution, the cabinet. 100 degrees the opposite is the cabinet of George Washington. As described by Thomas Jefferson, the nation's first secretary of state, President Washington would hold regular meetings of his department heads and would take regular votes where his vote, Washington's vote, counted but as one. According to Jefferson, When the crisis of 1793 occurred, war with Britain and France loomed, Washington met almost every day with his department head. James Madison began referring to this group as the cabinet, using a reference to the king's cabinet, a group of advisors to the English king. Literally, the word means little cabin, and in the sense we use it, speaking about American politics has nothing to do with the piece of furniture. The idea of king and advisors holed up in a little cabin or little room in a cabin became the cabinet. Such a kingly term did not make its way into the language of the Constitution. Like so many things, the Constitution is vague, and it can be sometimes a bull in a china shop. Powerful constitutional verbiage makes other things happen sometimes without directly calling for it. A president, for example, is sworn in by by the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Without that line about the swearing of the president, there might not have been a chief justice of the Supreme Court because it's not called for in the section about the judiciary. The line that creates the cabinet in Article 2 is, the president may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer of each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to their respective offices. That's it. That line creates executive departments. When Washington started, there were just four of these key departments. War, led by Henry Knox, State by Jefferson, Treasury by Alexander Hamilton, and the Attorney General, Edmund Randolph. No official duties were given to the cabinet, but Washington's early precedent seemed to follow through. It was an advisory body to the president, just like the English cabinet, an extension of himself and his executive authority. His use of it uh, as kind of a democracy within the executive branch did not continue. It never quite became that. No modern president would take a vote of his cabinet to determine what to do. Today, the cabinet consists of many offices, and offices not thought of in Washington's day are in the cabinet. Housing, labor, education, and the most recent title, though lacking the usual secretary uh, designation to become part of the cabinet, the director of Homeland Security. The cabinet has regular meetings, but... No one understands it to be a democracy within the executive, weighing in on all presidential decisions. They run their departments, their aspects of the federal government, and work with the president where he wishes, usually only in matters that affect what they do. 
the place the cabinet holds is determined by the debates of the Constitutional Convention, the president, uh, the precedent of presidential behavior, and two key historical events. The constitutional origins of the cabinet, which would lead to only a vague reference in the document, start with a battle over a plural or singular executive. One president or many? There were those who suggested a plural executive, a council of, say, three people or more, instead of one president. In such a system, the task could be split up among several people. Once you go with a single president, single executive, which the convention decided pretty early, then you've got two problems. A. Who will do all this executive work if you've just got one guy? And B. How do you get some of that power split among others? It's an awful lot of power for one man. The Constitutional Convention was very concerned with power and who had it. So the idea of a privy council or advisory council was floated. George Mason, fearing a strong president, argued that the convention delegates needed to create a council, especially for the task of nominations to federal office. Who would control appointments to federal office? It shouldn't be in the control of one man. He preferred that this council be made up of three representatives, north, south, and middle. Benjamin Franklin agreed with this idea. Such a council would be helpful to presidents, Ben Franklin said. But Mason's idea was voted down by the convention. Charles Pickney seems to be the most forceful advocate at the convention on this point, against such a council. He said, Such a council that had real power would either overshadow the president and make him look weak, or it would give him someone to blame if things went wrong, dilute the president's responsibility, which otherwise would be absolute. Any council... Pickney urged, must be voluntary. The convention agreed. The convention, most of whom were fans of a single executive, most of whom knew that George Washington would soon occupy that chair, agreed. So from the get-go, despite Washington's show of deference to his executive department heads, the cabinet never provided a check and balance on the president. By presidential deference, sure, some secretaries were stronger. John Quincy Adams was a very successful and well-known Secretary of State, and to some extent overshadowed Monroe. Lincoln allowed his Treasury Secretary Chase reign at the Treasury so long as his efforts funded the Civil War. One of the first events to test the strength of a cabinet versus a president, or in this case a vice president, was the death of President William Henry Harrison which led to the ascendance of John Tyler, the vice president. Whigs, especially Henry Clay, who had expected to run the country through the cabinet, since Harrison was a relatively unexperienced and old man, were now confronted with the death of the Whig president. John Tyler went to Washington to, as he read the Constitution, assume the presidency, become president. But there was a question. Was Tyler really a president? Or was he just the vice president coming to Washington to act as president? In a meeting with the cabinet, Tyler was adamant that he was now president and needed to be sworn in. The cabinet had different plans. They offered to allow Tyler to assume the duties of president, but under the agreement that Tyler would run things through the cabinet, and that meant through Henry Clay. Tyler refused. Congress, in the end, backed Tyler, and he was sworn in as president, not as a vice president acting as president. It would turn out he would oppose many of Harrison's cabinet's actions. He would oppose the Whig Party on a bank bill and on the annexation of Texas. Tyler won this battle because he had constitutional words to back up his claim to office. The Constitution said that the vice president at least, assumes the role of president. might not have been clear as to what we'd call the vice president after he did this, but it did 
give him a constitutional role. The cabinet had nothing. It didn't exist technically by virtue of the Constitution. The next event crucial to the relationship between the president and the cabinet was the Tenure of Office Act. When Andrew Johnson assumed the presidency and immediately got into a struggle with the radical Republican Congress, the Congress feared he would fire some of Lincoln's popular cabinet. So they passed the Tenure of Office Act, which denied the president the right to fire cabinet officers. Soon after, President Johnson would fire Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War. Though later, the Supreme Court would rule the Tenure of Office Act an unconstitutional breach of the separation of powers, the legislative branch overreaching. Johnson was impeached for violating the law and survived only by one vote in the Senate. Still, because of this struggle, president over cabinet was preserved. And it was clear that cabinet members serve at the pleasure of the president, nothing otherwise. So the cabinet, through constitutional talk, practice, and court decisions, is not a check on the president. They're not a democracy within the executive. They are the president's advisors, the president's managers of various departments, which in the end are his responsibility. The true function of the cabinet is easier seen in the vast work a president has come to engage in, and for the fact that very on, it became pretty clear that a president didn't get much help in deciding what to do from other branches of government. Washington learned when he went to Congress to get its sense of an Indian treaty. Congress made it clear they would decide on their own what to do with it, not in consultation with the president. That was a precedent that held. The Supreme Court was no help either. It said early on that it would not issue advisory opinions. Bring in a live issue, the court will decide, but not before. So the president needed people to help for planning, uh, to plan actions, and decide what to do, what course to take. We see the growth of the cabinet and new positions as new concerns came to the country. The Secretary of the Navy was developed in 1798, when we faced a maritime threat from France. Postmaster General was added in 1792 to handle that most important federal government function. Zachary Taylor added an Interior Department in 1849, after we acquired vast tracts of land in the Mexican War. A Commerce Department was added in 1903, Labor under Wilson in 1913. Jimmy Carter added Education and Housing and Energy in the 1970s. There are politics between cabinet members and presidents, just as there are politics in keeping them. Many of Lincoln's choices, Seward as Secretary of State, Simon Cameron as Secretary of War, Chase as Treasury, were the result of politics needed to win his nomination and then carry critical states into the general election. I enjoy the concept of a team of rivals, and I think it's right to use that descriptor when talking about Lincoln's confidence in working with several individuals on his team who wanted the office he was sitting in, most notably Salmon Chase, the Treasury Secretary. But Lincoln didn't pick these men out of thin air. He didn't just decide, oh, I'll have a team of rivals. He was going to have to pick these people. Seward, for instance, was uh, powerfully connected with the New York political machine of Thurlow Weed, Republican boss of New York. FDR benefited from having Cordell Hull, an obscure Tennessee Democrat, as Secretary of State. Hull never paid any attention to domestic policy in meetings, never became a new dealer. But FDR respected him and, and knew that Cordell Hull was popular with people, and it helped to have a conservative Democrat in his administration. Herbert Hoover knew that he had to keep Andrew Mellon as Treasury Secretary, since Mellon developed a strong connection to the prosperity of the 1920s, and it was said that people voted for Mellon as much as they did for Coolidge in 1924. President Clinton kept Janet Reno as Attorney General for his entire presidency, despite their sometimes adversarial relationship. He knew that as a president with an opposition Congress, he might face criticism from Republicans in Congress if he fired the key lawmaker of the country. President Bush chose Colin Powell and, in fact, paraded him in front of cameras while the 2000 election dispute was going on, a sign that people could expect that he'd be tapping the former 
general for Secretary of State if, if he became president. During the Iran hostage crisis of 1980, President Carter had to replace his Secretary of State. His Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance, had quit after it was learned that Carter had planned a rescue operation for the hostages against his wishes and without his knowledge. While Warren Christopher was an able deputy, one who would later become Secretary of State under Bill Clinton, Carter decided to go with former Senator Edmund Muskie. At that time, in 1980, facing re-election, facing a low approval rating, Carter needed a politician. It's fairly clear to see politics also at work in the decision to nominate Hillary Clinton for Secretary of State. Now, it should be said that President Obama will find many benefits in picking the former New York senator and first lady for the job. Because the office is the key diplomat, the key representative of America to the world, it helps to send someone to foreign countries who's of great prestige in America. But in terms of pure foreign policy experience, it would be clear to see that someone like Dennis Ross or Richard Holbrook have more breadth of knowledge than does former Senator Clinton. And so whatever the benefits, what's really at work here is Obama won the nomination in a contested Democratic primary and had to give something to this other wing of the Democratic Party. Didn't seriously consider Hillary Clinton for vice president. She was never vetted for that office and chose a man for vice president, Hillary Clinton being the foremost woman in Democratic politics, one might say. There were certainly a lot of political benefits to President Obama offering something to his former rival. And if he was to offer something, it had to be state. It is the only cabinet office with the kind of prestige for, that would appeal to someone who had seriously run for the presidency. So many times cabinet choices are for the reason of politics. Yet it seems presidents have a passive weapon to assert in the cases where they needed to nominate someone to their cabinet but didn't necessarily enjoy working with them. They can't fire certain people politically, but they can ignore or work around them quite easily in many cases. FDR worked around his war secretary, Harry Wooding, because he was an isolationist and didn't want to help England against Germany. Instead, FDR simply worked with Lewis Johnson, the assistant secretary of war, who was an internationalist. Herbert Hoover had to keep Andrew Mellon as his treasury secretary, but toned down some of the role and didn't give him the loose leash that Coolidge and Harding had. Most recently, President Bush kept Colin Powell as his secretary, but kept him a bit at arm's length. Condoleezza Rice and Donald Rumsfeld were more involved in the key decisions, while Colin Powell was a spokesperson. We talked about earlier how President Carter kept his Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance, deliberately out of discussions about a hostage rescue attempt in Iran in 1980. He knew that Vance opposed any military option and wanted to keep Vance focused on the diplomatic channels while he met separately with his defense secretary and his generals. This is the presidential option. Presidents have varying degrees of how they can use cabinet members, but it is their decision. Washington held votes. Wilson held few cabinet meetings and dislodged the tradition of having regular cabinet meetings, but he held them more frequently, for instance, when we approached war with Germany. Hedley Donovan, a Time reporter in the Carter White House uh, for one year, said that during the time he was there, the cabinet met only a few times together with the president. And presidents varied in how much they defer to their cabinets. Harding and Coolidge were very deferential to their cabinets. Harding advertised that he would put in bright men to run the country. And in a contrast to Wilson, he would replace the one-man government. Eisenhower used to defer to secretaries when asked a question by a reporter. You'll have to go see the secretary of this or that for the answer to your question. Reagan and Truman were examples of a bit of a mix. They relied on their secretaries for key decisions, but also worked around them or through them. George Shultz intensely prepared President Reagan for meetings with Gorbachev. And he was very involved in much of what Reagan did in foreign policy. 
But for some decisions, for instance, Reagan's support of the Star Wars or Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, Schultz only found out about it moments before Reagan announced it on television. And Schultz was not involved in the key decision to support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. For Harry Truman's part, he had kept Roosevelt's Secretary of State, Jim Barnes, but eventually had to tell him that he was going too far, and he said, I do not intend to delegate the authority of the president. The president's on the lever, and the cabinet fails to act as a cohesive group in most presidencies. Josephus Daniels, Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of the Navy, kept a diary during his time and described how Wilson's cabinet met. Wilson would bring up points on his mind for discussion, and then would allow secretaries to bring up anything they had that they wanted the group to discuss. Daniels noticed how Treasury Secretary William Gibbs McAdoo didn't bring up any Treasury items to discuss, so the Cabinet didn't discuss any Treasury items. Daniels also noted that the Cabinet was not a cooperative body. They operated as watertight compartments. When he asked Wilson's Secretary of Army for help uh, in supporting a Navy initiative during a cabinet meeting, Wilson's Secretary of the Army said, Let's be honest here, Joe. You don't give a damn about the Army, and I don't give a damn about the Navy. It echoed rivalries in the cabinet from Washington's time between Jefferson and Hamilton. And 30 years later, in Franklin Roosevelt's cabinet, it was no different. When Henry Wallace, Secretary of Agriculture, tried to get Henry Morgenthau's Treasury Secretary's help with farm subsidies. Morgenthau replied, That's your cross to bear, Henry. The cabinet is a group of people competing for budgets and competing for presidential attention in many cases. Cabinet doesn't act in concert, and therefore it has never gained ground on the presidency as an institution. There are a couple other measures of the role of the cabinet in American politics. One is that the cabinet has not produced a president since Herbert Hoover, 1928. He was Calvin Coolidge's Commerce Secretary. And that's now 80 years ago since a cabinet member became president. Before that, it was 54 years when James Buchanan became president after a run as Secretary of State. By contrast to the early years of American government, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams, and Martin Van Buren had served in a president's cabinet prior to being elected president themselves. It was a springboard and no longer seems to be so. The second sign of a bit of a decline in the power of the cabinet is their place in the line of succession. They used to be in line right after the vice president. That was changed in the 1940s to the Speaker of the House and the Senate pro tempore. Secretary of State, and then Treasury. Despite this change, no Speaker of the House has ever become President. It is, however, common practice not to have the President, VP, Speaker, and the entire Cabinet in any one place. And hence, during the State of the Union speech, when all are assembled there, one Cabinet member usually stays behind in another area. Although, as of yet, no one but a sitting Vice President has ever entered the Presidency, The cabinet's mitigation in the line of succession just illustrates how the cabinet has become less top of mind when it comes to the presidency. At least, some may think, the speaker was elected by someone. The cabinet was elected by no one. What right do they have to become the key office? The cabinet has also suffered a bit by the ascension in modern times of three particular individuals within the federal government. Three individual positions within the federal government. The vice president has become more powerful and more important than it was in the 19th century. There is now a national security advisor that runs the national security apparatus for the president and is the key consultant on foreign policy decisions and late breaking crises. And since the 1940s, the White House chief of staff has resumed a very important role. There's only so much time and presidential attention available, and these three individuals have taken more of it in modern times, to the detriment of the cabinet. Obama has chosen his cabinet. Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State. Timothy Geithner, Secretary of the Treasury. Robert Gates as Secretary of War. 
keeping Bush as Secretary of War in place. Hilda Santos as Secretary of Labor. As Machiavelli said in his famous book, The Prince, the choosing of ministers is no small matter for the prince. The first opinion that is formed over ruler's intelligence is based on the quality of the men he has around him. While individual cabinet members may rise to the level of a key presidential advisor, of a key part of an administration, it does, it seem, to be true about American politics throughout most of history, what was true about Italian politics in the time Machiavelli wrote. The key function of the cabinet is to provide a positive impression of the administration to the country. President Obama has made some celebrated cabinet picks. What their actual role will be in the running of the country will be totally and completely up to President Obama. With history beating up politics, I'm Bruce Carlson. Website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. You can post a comment there. Uh, The archive, the archive of the show featuring most of the podcasts that we've done since 2006 is available. Uh, It's 1999. We've estimated that there's enough content on that archive site to fill about 8 to 10 standard audio books. Now, how much of the content you don't have is going to depend on how long you've been listening to the program. Uh, We will from time to time post additional content there. There's going to be a podcast on representation, for instance, that will only be available to those who uh, buy the archive. So that's at myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Thanks for listening.